What I want to talk about today is a Sandfire Coast Icon project that was actually funded through the Clean Energy's Futures Fund, the Biodiversity Fund, because of the value of salt marsh in climate change mitigation. What the money is provided for over five years, finishing up in 2017, is a lot of on-ground works uh, which needed to be shovel ready. Um, trying to look at strategies for allowing salt marsh to retreat but a big part of what we're doing is just trying to get the community on board about how useful salt marsh can be um, and increase their stewardship of it. The programs also relate a lot to shorebird values because the coastline we're talking about is a, is a mosaic of marsh, tidal flat and mangroves. So this is how we sort of tended to view salt marsh in the past, a bit of a wasteland. This is Mutton Cove, a, a coastal reserve sort of buffered in between industry down at Port Adelaide. Um, but the coast north of Adelaide, which is our project site that goes up from Port Adelaide through to Malala, up the end of uh, the NRM region here, is this wonderful mosaic of mangrove, intertidal mudflat, salt marsh, and for a big part of it, the old salt fields that's being decommissioned now. And it's that mosaic that makes it really important. We, we undertake works on about 70 um, coastal sites throughout our region, and they're done, again, in partnership with landholders. Um, the coastal conservation assessments basically map conservation threat, or conservation asset and conservation threat. And this is the map for, for Adelaide and Northern Adelaide. Red is high conservation value lands, based on a whole range of biodiversity measures, including the intactness of remnant vegetation, which is really important up there. If you look at the threats though, the threats that were mapped, and a lot of them relate to zoning and land development and mining, minerals, tenements, are also really up in that high value conservation area. We were able through having that national, that statewide approach to the conservation coastal assessment being done to really influence the Greater Adelaide Plan. So that area north of Adelaide originally in the draft plan was sort of this brown development mining zone. Um, in the, in the plan that got out, it's actually a green environmental area of environmental significance. So, I mean, that's a real good change that comes about by planning and having good plans and good data to back up planning decisions. The plan provides a range of recommendations about what's needed for climate change adaptation. And what's key, what the key message there is that we need to use the lands we have to try and allow for retreat of these environments. And what we're planning for is what's called coastal squeeze. So you know, these are very robust systems. They'll adapt. The coast has been there for millennia um, if they're given room. But the problem that we have in modern society is we've got lots of infrastructure. We've got levee banks, we've got railway, rail corridors, we've got roads. And so as sea level rises, those coastal habitats get squeezed out and there's nowhere for them to retreat. Another species we've been looking at is, is the sandfire thornbill, which is reliant on you know, uh, higher um, sand, sandfire habitats. Um, again, you know, I don't know that we would be able to save this bird from extinction locally, but we can try and conserve the habitats. Um, the habitat, and we've done a lot of mapping and revisiting the mapping that was done in the 80s to know where this bird occurs, so we can prioritise the sites that we might want to look at, restoring and, and planning for retreat. Um, you know, some of the all the places where it likes are right on the coast. They're going to get flooded out by sea level rise. Um, or mangroves will grow over them. So for the birds themselves and for that tectocornia, the, the beads salt marsh, there may not be a future in our region, but there is, certainly is a, a future for salt marsh if we can allow it to adapt and for all the specific little creatures and other plants that live in those environments. So I guess what we're trying to plan for is not just individual species, but planning for habitat and hope we get it right that those species can adapt to the future. And the work that we've done over the last eight years really has led to the policy work that uh, led to the, the, the election commitment to establish the Adelaide International Bird Sanctuary. The great thing about this sanctuary, as well as it being really good for migratory shorebirds and, and other things, is that it's securing crown land and all, that was under mining lease, and it's also secure, has secured freehold land that allows for retreat. One of the real issues about planning for coastal retreat is usually the government doesn't own a lot of that land or have, has, doesn't have enough land to be able to plan for the future. But this, is a, this could be a really good case study um, for how we could adapt.
coastal salt marsh. The sorts of things that really are needed to be done, it's like sticking pipes under roads, it's doing a bit of you know, levelling of banks, um, widening some existing channels and just a bit of landscaping really. Um, it's not a lot, but we could get some major benefit. One of the things, you know, salt marsh often gets the bad rap about being a, a haven for mosquitoes and other things, but it's usually degraded salt marsh. So if you can restore the tidal flows and you don't get pooling of water that mos mosquitoes like, then you're also controlling some of those issues that the public, you know, perceive as being uh, health issues with salt marsh as well. The sand dunes themselves are natural buffers, you know, to, to sea level rise, if they're allowed to move and if you're allowed to if they're allowed to rebuild. You know, we've lost those opportunities for most of the metro coast. Um, a technique that is replacing engineering approaches in Europe and in uh, the United States and also on the East Coast is what's called living shorelines. Um, and instead of constructing a seawall or a hard barrier, which basically can get eroded around and every time you stop a seawall, you find the erosion increases where you've stopped the seawall, so you've got to extend the seawall somewhere else. Um, the Living Shores approach is looking at using revegetation and natural materials to absorb the shock of the waves and reduce erosion. Um, and that's you know, something that we're looking at exploring as well. Coast Protection Board are, are pretty keen on those sorts of approaches. Because um, a lot of the, the other sorts of climate change forums I go to have really been focused you know, on the coast around infrastructure protection. And it's not simply just to, we can't afford to keep looking at engineering solutions, more seawalls and things. We either got a plan for retreat, and most councils you flag that with, you know, don't want to go that down that path. I mean, we're, we're more than happy to invest in uh, highway infrastructure and have compulsory acquisition of three to 400 houses um, to put through a highway, but we're very reticent to buy up a, you know, half a million dollar property in an area where we might be spending millions to, on coastal protection. Um, so we have to think about how we, what the values are in the future and how we can plan for that, but they're tough political decisions. Well, we all know that many cities are growing hot and hotter as warming hits metro areas, and hot cities are lethal. In August 2003, that unprecedented heat wave in Western Europe resulted in about 70,000 heat-related deaths, and heat islands are set to grow. By 2050, um, urban surface area in the US is expected to expand by a third. There's scientific consensus that extreme heat and air pollution each cause significant urban health problems and that the negative impact of each is expected to intensify with climate change. And there is also consensus that a critical element in healthy cities is nature, including the green, and the blue, plants and water. And the importance of green and blue space um, in urban landscapes is now recognised by many health, water, planning, design, policy professionals and beginning to be recognised by governments. South Australia's Green Infrastructure Project is hosted by the Botanic Gardens of South Australia, funded by the listed partners. And one of our major research activities has been developing the evidence base for green infrastructure, which is a wide ranging literature review um, with an emphasis on peer reviewed research from around the world, which is now utilised nationally. The first and most obvious critical adaptation re relates to temperature. And as we know, the modification of urban climates, especially through temperature reduction, is one of the outstanding benefits of green infrastructure. Urban microclimates are characterised by significantly higher temperatures, higher wind speeds, lower net rainfalls than surrounding landscapes. And the urban heat island effect, which is an unintended consequence of urbanisation, is a significant contributor to health risks. Tree canopies can reduce the temperature of surfaces they shade by many, many degrees. Parks with large trees can be several degrees cooler than surrounding urban landscapes, with the greatest zone of influence being downwind and particularly in summer, potentially this is a great place for aged care homes and hospitals and public housing. And not only can temperatures be reduced, but so can energy, energy demand. So a 2% ambient temperature reduction is linked to a 6% reduction in demand for cooling. And it's estimated that inner urban areas are regularly 3.5 to 4.5 degrees warmer than surrounding areas. 
and the urban heat island will continue to rise by about, by about one degree per decade over and above that caused by global warming. And not surprisingly, we really do have tree canopy inequity. Within a city, canopy cover can range from 3% to 75%. And in general, it's the suburbs with the least canopy cover are the most socially disadvantaged and the least educated. What can we do in practice and relatively quickly? There are numerous green infrastructure related strategies for helping adapt, adapt to a changing climate and to urban heat islands. And these are just a few that we've identified. So we can use vegetation to shade thermally massive surfaces and in, include evapotranspiration. We can plant trees to achieve a greater than 30% canopy ground cover in all suburbs. Match our water systems to vegetation. Use permeable surfaces to encourage water infiltration and evapotranspiration. And research shows these should be as large as possible, no less than 30% of a site. We use our recycled water systems, our stormwater harvesting and our water sensitive urban design as appropriate to irrigate our vegetation. So a blueprint that combines trees and other plants, water systems and water bodies, high albedo surfaces, green roofs and walls, permeable surfaces, wind management and ecosystem protection and restoration is likely to be the best approach.